Hello, friends, and welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we create fantastical worlds with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty. I'm here with my co-hosts, Daniel Quinn and Courtney Staples. On today's episode, we have another patron prompt from patron Seth, whose prompt sounds like this. Maybe there's something in the air, or maybe I took Don't Look Up way too personally. I crave post-apocalyptic dystopias. And uh, spoilers for the movie Don't Look Up are in this prompt, so it might be a little bit difficult. But anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's move on. If you've seen the movie or you don't mind spoilers, you'll know that the Jeff Bezos type fucks off to space as a last-ditch effort to escape cataclysm. But what if such a scheme actually worked. You would have a bunch of oligarchs from different disciplines with a limited supply of tech and equipment from their colony ship and a virgin planet to start on anew. And presumably, some of them would be even competent. The Tenet, there's only one this time. Normally, we we have people give us three, but this time, there's just one. The caveat in the form of a pre-established Tenet, which is, this isn't a cyberpunk setting, and maybe there are reasons for that. And with that, we have the premise for our show. And before we get into it, remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com, submit a prompt, and oh boy, we will absolutely build your world on air. If you want to follow us on social media, we're over at Let's World Build. If you want to join our Discord and talk about world building, movies, or what have you, there's a link for that in the description. And if you want to get patron-only episodes, or if you're just feeling particularly generous, you can always give us money over on Patreon, with the link for that in the description as well. With all of the shilling out of the way, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Courtney, why don't you start us off with your first tenet? Establish this weird corporate dystopia that we have that is somehow not a cyberpunk setting. That is going to be the, like... You might as well tell me that we need to have it set in the Wild West with dinosaurs because, (laughs) like, how are we doing this without cyberpunk? Like, that's all about corporate dystopias, you know? Yeah, yeah. Did he say in the premise that it has to be a corporate dystopia? Because I don't think he says dystopia, that it has to be. I mean, he says, I crave post-apocalyptic corporate dystopias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't say that the premise itself has to be a dystopia. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, technically true, but that's what he's craving. And I'm I'm trying to sate that level of craving, Daniel. You know what I mean? <laughs> Daniel's not really willing to sate the craving. Okay, understand. No, not, not really. <laughs> I just want to let Courtney continue. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, let's, let's see where Courtney starts us off. Um, I'm guessing it's some kind of a, like a mill where you sacrifice children <laughs> with, and like the blood comes out. Wow. And that's how they support themselves. So Courtney, why don't you start us off and tell us what's going on here? Well, funny you say that because in our most recent exclusive episode on Patreon, uh, we talked about what each of us brings to the world building table, so to speak. And somehow I ended up being associated with like blood and pain and suffering, which there's no somehow about it. No. Courtney. Stop rejecting who you are and just accept the bloodthirsty monster that lies within. I, I do fully embrace that. But um, but in that episode, I, I jokingly said that I'd be sure to bring lots of cute puppies and kittens in from now oh, on God. to like counterbalance the really depressing shit. Uh, so to honor that plan. I do, in fact, want to bring cute animals into the setting in the form of kind of a Noah's Ark type situation where the the spacecraft that had left Earth or whatever starting planet that we're working from um, is storing various types of animals to use to populate whatever planet they've ended up on. Um, That said, given the kind of people on this craft, the the animals don't necessarily need to be the most practical ones. Like um, maybe someone wanted to bring along their herd of like, purebred Pomeranians or whatever. And that's that's where we're starting with this. <laughs> so we're starting with a puppy mill instead. <laughs> okay. Courtney, is your second tenant and then that's their main source of food? Because that's legitimately where no, I think you're going with this. No, it's, it's not. <laughs> I swear. Well, that's going to be my second tenant. <laughs> so, uh, Daniel... We we have a we have literal puppies in our setting before we even get to this dystopic future. What did you have in mind? Because when you were suggesting that, you know, like, oh, it doesn't have to be a dystopia, that implies to me that you have something in mind. And god damn it, we're gonna watch that pendulum swing. So Daniel, mm-hmm. what's your tenet? 
Um, yeah, I, I just think I'm very bored of the concept of like, okay, you have evil billionaires, so they're evil and therefore dystopia. Like how many times have we done that before? Like just in media in general. Um, and that's the expected way to take this mm -hmm. prompt. Mm -hmm. Um, and whether it ends up being a dystopia or not, I don't think the premise explicitly states that it has to be. He just says that he just says expecting that. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I would like to say is that, uh, contrary to our expectations, um, these oligarchic tech overlords, whether it's as a result of their journey or whether it's because this is how they were to begin with, are actually genuinely interested in creating an egalitarian society mm. with their wealth and their power. <laughs> and um, they are not selfish and they actually have good intentions in this in creating this arc. Oh, no, we have some severe. Uh... Yeah, we, we got we got some things we got to work out, Daniel. Yeah, this is far too unbelievable to me. I don't think it works. <laughs> Honestly, I, I agree with that sentiment, <laughs> Courtney. You know why? Because I feel like one of my favorite movies of all time is Contact, um, mm. yeah. which is, has Jodie Foster. And in fact, there's a billionaire in that one who's actually a good guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I challenge you all to imagine a world where <laughs> rich people are not fundamentally evil for the sake of the premise. Well, OK, so I, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief that far mm -hmm. right but unfortunately some of my tenets kind of uh don't really work up that way so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of i'm kind of torn as to how i want to approach this now because i agree with you daniel i think that the idea of like the evil corporate billionaire mm -hmm. uh while while played out and while tired i think we're tired of it because we don't want to get like constantly skull fucked in reality and then escape to a fantasy world where we're constantly getting skull fucked by the same billionaire. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of agree with you there. Um, I also tend to believe that movies like contact are fucking corporate propaganda for like, Oh look, because to me, right. What? Like, <laughs> How is that possible <laughs> for billionaires? Let me explain. And, and and I will I will even go so far as to say that Marvel and that kind of oeuvre does something similar as well, which is to me, right? It's all we need in society is like the good guy with a gun principle, right? So the way that we stop bad guys with guns is with good guys with guns. And the way that we solve societal problems is we need one good person with good intentions to solve the world's ills. I see that echoed in a lot of like, uh, ra rather than attack things in a systemic level, I see things as like we we are deifying these individuals far too much. But I I'm I'm going to like step off my soapbox for a little bit, and I'm going to try and allow myself to uh like un unstick my ass for right now, just for the sake of the premise and for the sake of your tenet, Daniel. However, my tenet, the one that I wanted to uh start off with is the oligarchs who fucked off into space severely underestimated the amount of work required to rebuild society. And half of them ended up cannibalizing the other half. And I don't mean that literally. <laughs> I mean that like conflict and, uh, you know, the, the kind of mindset that you have to have to become an oligarch in the first place, severely like hamstrung the initial generation of these people so who are left i don't know i'm not really one to believe any of that but 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 that's where my setting kind of starts is with like a bloody coup to begin with so start us there uh with thoughts on that can we say then that the out so in order for mine to not be totally nullified <laughs> can we say that the outcome of whatever this initial conflict is to establish order within the ship um is that you end up with a set of the oligarchs mm. are actually good. I'm yeah. okay. I think yeah. that is, that makes the most sense to me. Agreed. Mm. Yeah. Where, where it's like, oh, maybe the idealistic ones are like, wait a minute, we see what's happening. And then something goes down and then mm -hmm. there is a rebellion, like a mini rebellion that happens. Among like they the didn't oligarchs. want to recreate the conditions that led to them leaving the earth. And so right. they, perhaps they organized with those, you know, other people on the ship, you know, in a different way to put this down in the end. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I have so many questions about the setting, but we need we're, we're going to get through to the second round of tenets. Uh, Courtney or Daniel, do either of you have anything that we can kind of bounce off with or maybe even expand the world a little bit? Yeah, um, I think my second one might be able to tie in to a rebellion of sorts. Um, 
going back to like my usual realm of suffering would be that on the spacecraft, obviously these rich people needed some sort of underclass to do the work for them. Um, and I was going to say whether that's human slaves or robots or something in between. So maybe it was a human underclass that the sort of better oligarchs realized like, oh, we can't do this again. We can't like make slaves out of this population. We need to mm. we need to protect them from the others. And that's that's how that initial kind of bloody struggle happened. OK, OK. So so your tenet is. There was an underclass that is there to serve the oligarchs. Yes. Yes. Okay. And now we're imagining that they somehow play a role within the rebellion itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Whether okay. they were directly involved with it or it was sort of a realization, um, kind of come to Jesus moment on behalf of some of the, mm -hmm. the more empathetic billionaires. I'm far more attracted to Daniel's idea now. Mm -hmm. if what we see as a result is a literal uprising, because that to me is far more <laughs> attractive as an ideal, because to, like it, it is hard for me to separate this idea that most of the people who make billions of dollars like have to have some level of like psychopathy or sociopathy or like immense privilege and wealth that makes them blind to a lot of suffering. It's It's hard for me to remove that from my brain. And I think that if we remove half of the billionaires and just leave the ones who are like, yo, I want to make cool stuff. Like I, I'm far more attracted to that concept. Um, like I said, I'm willing to unstick my ass and have like a couple of billionaires in there who are like, nah, we want to make cool stuff and not, you know, like overtly uh, <laughs> exploit. People. Yeah, I mean, what, what I want to get at, too, is that we tend to paint people with a brush, right, and mm -hmm. make them into one monolithic concept right so we've done I that we that. villainize you know different classes and the decline of class warfare that we deal with in our society um goes both ways right so i think you know if there was this like microcosm on this ship of um of history right so like it almost mm -hmm. repeated itself you know this mm -hmm. this whole class warfare over however, however long um they've been on the ship such that um they went through an upper class rising up and revolting maybe you end up having a diversity of people that are at the top who now mm -hmm. have different opinions as a result of this revolution. And mm -hmm. so maybe these, these oligarchs aren't really oligarchs anymore. Maybe they're technocrats, you know, and mm -hmm. they've kind of earned their position in society at this point because they helped mm -hmm. lead this revolution with the resources they brought into the ship to begin with. I suppose that's something that we really haven't talked about is like, are we dealing with cryo sleep? Is it something that you had to be like, awake and there's generations forming along mm -hmm. this long kind of journey mm -hmm. you know like that's that's an interesting question to kind of ask do you have something in your tenant that might help assuage that or um i don't know i think it could work either way we could say a yeah. large span of time happens um in this mm -hmm. journey or it could be short um we don't really know the conditions of leaving the earth or anything mm. yeah i mean if we wanted to go straight from the movie it would be a cryogenic sleep mm -hmm. right Right. Interesting. Because when I say like microcosm of history, like you've isolated these group of people. We don't know how many there are. I'm assuming there's like a critical mass for humanity to survive. Right. So that's a lot of, a lot of people. Um, I mean that like they would have gone through all the phases of understanding how to govern a society really fast mm -hmm. <laughs> and possibly arrive because they already have the resources at their disposal mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. these billionaires are the ones who set this up. Possibly perhaps they moved through something like, you know, a capitalist society into something beyond that faster than they would have on the earth being closed up in such a small space. Mm -hmm. What, what might be kind of interesting as well is like within my tenant, right? Like them severely underestimating the amount of work required to rebuild society that might humble them and right. make them appreciate the kind of, you know, systems that were set up on earth previously. So maybe they come into this as like, oh, we're going to be the oligarchs, the technocrats, we're going to be the ruling class. And then once they're on the planet and they have to start building things and like it becomes far more difficult for them to square that kind of concept that they have in, in their head with what's actually going down, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of, I think to me, that's an interesting angle that we can help uh, blunt the edge of what we might see within the billionaire class. Yeah, there could also be just a, this is sort of like a 
granola crunchy type idea but just the idea of going to an untouched like pure type planet Mm -hmm. landing there and and seeing all of this nature that's been completely untouched there's no industry there's no pollution um that could even potentially give a change of heart to some of them Mm -hmm. like they don't want to they don't want to fuck it up now that they see it like that yeah i mean the, we could transform what is typically like a psychopathic vision of the CEO to a heroic vision of what society could be. And yeah, that sounds mm. blasphemous to, to any leftist <laughs> ideology, but this is mm. fantasy, right? So right. if we can't do away with the villains, can we change them? You know, that's what I'm suggesting too in the Senate. Right. And and, and that's and that's what I'm I'm agreeing to is that like, yeah, I can see how this might work out. Mm -hmm. from a human perspective in regards to, you know, like watching them change and then watching like the harshness of these new conditions, forcing them to change, Mm -hmm. you know, like think of, um, so to Courtney's point, like imagine if you had someone like Hammond from Jurassic park who granted, you know, was like a little prophet hungry gremlin, but at Mm -hmm. the same time, he was also this grandpa, right. That you loved (laughs) who dreamed of something that in the end was a horror. Right. Right. But there is something there in him that's human that we are attracted to as a character. So I wonder, you know, like, like she, as she's saying, when they arrive on this planet and they see what's possible and, and having gone through this bloody revolution in their own ship, they think, okay, here's how I can apply my ambition in a way that will mean something more than just like investments. Like Mm -hmm. I'm used Mm -hmm. to in the past. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's work through our tenets and try and add some more stuff to it. Maybe we can figure that out. Uh, Daniel, what did you have for your second tenant? Lead us there. Lead us to the promised land, Daniel. <laughs> I am seeing on this planet that they have found inexplicable, enormous geometrical objects of unknown design. Okay, so we got BDOs. All right. Yes. Okay, that that opens us up quite a bit as well. And now now we're getting into like maybe a uh, Titan AE type situation as well, which I'm totally okay with, mind you. Um, I'm stumped right now. I'm like trying to figure out how we can kind of square things here. So I'm. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we should try answering some questions like. Yes, I agree. Um, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. You know, like what was, I, does the, I don't remember what the prompt says anything about the state of the earth that led to humans leaving it i assume just um, were... cataclysm it says a cataclysm okay right. so like you know uh, i guess we should answer at a minimum uh, did this sh- the ship obviously contain a critical mass for humanity to survive there's a number to place on that right mm-hmm. 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 um was the number reduced um in the ju- in the revolution how long was the revolution was it totally a cryo sleep um was it a quick thing that happened after they woke mm-hmm. up um what's the conditions of that because that would change how a lot of things happened now, what if it was some sort of like weird, like not not psychic, but tech related revolution in that they were still within cryo sleep when it actually went down? Oh, it happened like in their minds while yeah. sleeping. Yeah, they were able <gasps> to like manipulate controls and essentially like kill off the yeah. the undesirables by way of shutting down their their chambers. Or something so only like certain people woke up because most yeah. of them were killed. Yeah, or some of them were killed that that's a very interesting concept and that's that's certainly something i'm like very interested in Mm, that's cool um because now because in my mind right like if we're if we're thinking about cryo sleep why do i feel like the underclass didn't get to have cryo sleep Mm -hmm. that for this journey that they're actually just on board and forced to deal with the age and the time that it takes to actually travel to this planet like only the elite were able to sleep in the cryo chambers. And so is that something we want to explore a little bit? Cause I love the idea that this happened during cryo sleep, mm. but I'm also interested in this concept of, well, you know, maybe that's the only time that you could have done it. Maybe there's this whole quiet rebellion that happened where they targeted specific people. And then a counter rebellion to that, where it's like, we have to stop killing people. This is fucking untenable. <laughs> And like morally reprehensible, right? Mm. I think it would be interesting if um, 
if there is a particular class of people who were assigned to be awake and maintain the ship and have generations of, of existence on it, because I'm sure I'm assuming it's going to take a long time to get to this planet, right? Because right, it's right. maybe a sublight speeds. But it, I don't think it should be the majority of the population. So like, I think maybe there's a class of people who are enough to maintain the ship who have children who are awake, right? Mm -hmm. But the critical mass population is sleeping because you don't, you, they can't right. risk them being harmed when they get to the Earth because they have to be alive to be able to procreate. Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, those maintenance people are the ones that Courtney was saying is like that underclass right. who mm -hmm. maybe can interface with the virtual realm where they're sleeping in. And that's where you get this intrigue between the two sides. Like you've got the middle class who are sleeping, the ultra wealthy, which I assume are in like a very protected part of the ship because they have to be the ones who direct everything mm -hmm. who are sleeping. And then you've got this maintenance class who are awake with certain credentials. Right. Yeah, I could almost see it kind of going a different way where the the upper class is in the full cryogenic sleep, the lower class mm -hmm. is also in the form of cryogenic sleep, but not as safe or as um, comfortable, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then like the middle class of like, let's say scientists and technicians are the ones who are awake, kind of tending to everything. Oh, okay. That could work too. Yeah, because they would know what to mm -hmm. do to maintain right. the ship. Yeah. And maybe they were the ones who even like set up whatever like neural link is going on during mm -hmm. the duration of their their journey. Like if they had hundreds or thousands of years to to come up with certain things, yeah. they'd probably just be fiddling around creating things on the ship. Mm -hmm. It it might also be, I mean, like having a rotating skeleton crew where you're like mm -hmm. you're out of cryo sleep for two years and then you're back in, and it's like on a rotation. That might be an interesting way to keep like the the population relatively low. You know, it's, it's not like, mm -hmm. oh, we need an astronomical amount of people on this ship in order for it to function. Mm -hmm. And also, like, it also keeps that middle class available as well. Yeah, I think if you have rotating technicians, that would make the most sense because mm -hmm. they don't have to then um, procreate necessarily, even over a hundred right, years. Right. Mm -hmm. Question. Yep. Um, how do we feel about taking the setting and just having it be entirely on the ship as it's traveling to this new planet? Kind of like the Battlestar Galactica, but less dark and miserable. Um, I don't know. I kind of like getting to the planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's fine. I, I want it. Look, I'm here to toss out ideas and curveballs. Mm -hmm. And like, as long as we're here to like serve the story and the prompt that we see fit. Right. Yeah. I just want to know what the conditions on the ship were that led up to it, basically. Right. You know? Yeah, agreed. <sighs> See, I think there's so many interesting stories that we can tell yeah. all along the journey and when we get there. Like, mm -hmm. There's a lot of cool stuff that we have available to us, you know? I mean, I think what would be important is to stick with kind of at least the, the theme what I was talking about is if, you know, there were um, crimes committed on, on each side, each part of this, the strata, right? So, like, there were evil billionaires who wanted to take advantage of the situation even while sleeping, right? To set things up in their favor once they arrived. Mm -hmm. oh. There were also like technicians who were aligned with them or who saw this project as problematic or had their own issues. They also interfered, you know, and then there were people who were regular people on the ground who got caught up in this too. So like whatever political revolution happened in the sleep, you know, like it touched everyone mm -hmm. and it was only in their coming together yep. that they were able to put a stop to it in the end. That is a great, great idea, mm -hmm. Daniel. That's mm -hmm. something that I think is really fascinating. I even yeah. like this idea that like this corporate, because to me, right, that reeks of corporate espionage. That's what they would consider it. Mm -hmm. Even though it's like literally murdering people, that's the level of kind of like espionage that I would imagine is happening. I could even see it. So maybe this is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like designed opposition, you know, yeah. where it's like one of the billionaire, the evil billionaires uh, sends one of their agents to kind of instill a rebellious attitude. And then mm -hmm. they start targeting the people who aren't this guy. And the other one, like they have to uncover this so that they have to set up a counter faction. And there's right. like this whole mm -hmm. intrigue that happens all while they're sleeping and right. among the main people are awake. So, so the person who I might want to agree with, who it's like, yeah, we need to kill these billionaires because they're evil, what have you. And I might be kind of sympathetic towards that. I wouldn't obviously like on it from a moral perspective, I'm against murdering anyone, you know, for, for any reason. <laughs> anyway, anyway, this is not about my morals. The concept is like, like that one was a terrorist, essentially. They, they, they right. took it too far. Right. Mm -hmm. Ex exactly. Mm -hmm. And then uncovering that plot is an interesting bit of lore as well. So mm -hmm. like there is this kind of shadow war that's happening and the morality play that kind of uh, plays out is also really interesting to me. 
so that uh, Daniel, kudos to you, man. That's a fascinating mm-hmm. idea. Mm-hmm. I, I, I go down in history as redeeming millionaires. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, that's your burden to bear. Uh, man. I'm, not, I'm not here to save you from that one. Now. <laughs> I still, I still love John Hammond, though. I think he was a great character. <laughs> oh, he's well. In the book, I know he's way more more evil. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's like deliberately like monstrous in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so, would you envision? Um, once the journey is complete, do you think that everybody would be sort of waking up finally at the same time? Or would there be like a staggered kind of thing going on? I'm wondering like if people are, if there are certain people who are unaware of what took place with the rebellion, what their response would be when they woke up. Mm-hmm. I mean, how long was the journey? Um, I mean, in the movie, it was like tens of thousands of years, I think. Oh, really? I think that might be too long <laughs> if, because they were all asleep, right? Like, so it didn't matter. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was fully asleep. But yeah, this is this is definitely a shorter uh, time frame that we're working with. I think. I'd say I'd say you need it to be one lifetime because you want some of the mm-hmm. people who were physically awake and witnessed some of this in rotation to be able to be there for the to tell about it or to have some input. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to toss out a nice round even number and say 120 years. That's how long yeah. this journey took. Long enough for a lot of shit to go down. Long enough to where rotations happened and mm-hmm. the working class have aged somewhat noticeably. Probably like they've each aged 10 to 20 years while the the billionaire class has not at all. Mm-hmm. You know, so so like that's kind of interesting and, and noticeable. The other, the other kind of thing that I'm interested in, right, is the crew who are awake, they're responsible, I assume, for feeding information to those who are in cryosleep. Can we talk about those who mm-hmm. are in cryosleep? Do they have consciousness or are they like completely out of it? Like I, I close my eyes and I wake up and it's 120 years later. Mm-hmm. Like, or is it I close my eyes and now my brain is like in some neural network that is conscious and able to make moves to happen. Yeah, I was picturing like a neural network of some sort. Um, mm-hmm. In um, in the show Raised by Wolves, there's kind of something like that, though it's like a, a full-on interactive, like looks oh, real yeah. kind of thing. But I feel like this could be more limited than that. Mm. I wonder if there's a distinction in type of network. So I, <laughs> I, I imagine the billionaires, because they have to have kind of an input into how things proceed, Mm-hmm. um how are more aware of the actual passage of time mm-hmm. in whatever sleeping mm-hmm. apparatus they're in and they can communicate with the maintenance people but the regular people possibly live on in a sort of sort of dream where time is indeterminate yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Can, can we have it so the neural network just looks like meta or like looks like oh, look yeah it looks like uh like just a bad 3d rendering where you like walk around oh what was that like crypto world thing Did oh crypto that? land yeah yeah let's have it be crypto land <laughs> yeah. i'm totally down for that daniel has no idea what we're talking about and nope. i can't wait for us to share the video with him later so it's he can so just bad. be appalled <laughs> yeah uh okay so yeah i'm, I'm cool with that courtney I, I love that concept mm. and i like the idea daniel that we are working within a kind of neural network that the billionaires are aware and they are making conscious moves and stuff like that. I think that's a good place to start as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like we've kind of established the ship and I feel like we've established that timeline fairly well. I love the idea of the rebellion kind of happening. I love the idea that there is information that those who are awake have not input into the computer. So those who are asleep don't get a full kind of history of what actually happened Mm -hmm. you know because i would imagine that people would believe that you know the cryo chambers fail at some rate so there is a certain level of death expected among those who are you know who who are within the cryo sleep itself right Mm -hmm. yeah it could be like a, a history that they make up um saying that oh there was just a certain percentage that died right uh nothing could be done oh right and in order to sort of kind of put people at ease rather mm-hmm. than be like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. we just murdered all these guys in their sleep. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes sense because that would be a way to quell panic, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I'm seeing this as, by the way, I'm seeing this as like a prestige HBO slash, you know, raised by wolves yes. type story yeah, yeah. where you start as they land and then mm-hmm. you see flashbacks mm-hmm. of these moments happening and you see like 
this person as they are now and it's like highly that. psychological yes absolutely, absolutely. yeah 100 percent. because you know like the story really isn't colonizing this new planet although that's happening it's about like how do you come to terms with um starting over like this and mm -hmm. all the characters have their own experiences of what that meant for them yeah and what you leave behind of course because mm -hmm. that's always the thing that we're most interested in when it comes to post-apocalyptic fiction right I mean, look at look at all of the really good post-apocalyptic stuff. It's not about, you know, like, oh, what you're building towards is what you've left behind because that's what you're trying to examine, right? Sort of. Maybe. Not sure if I totally agree with that. <laughs> Wait, say that again? Uh, who, me or Courtney? The thing you said that prompted her. I was looking at a star chart and um, some figures to see if, <laughs> how far in space they got. So I wasn't paying attention to that. Of moment. course you would, Daniel. <laughs> you were like so on the opposite side of oh. like world building for me sometimes where I'm like, I don't fucking care. I'll make that star shit up. I don't fucking care. When it comes to sci-fi, I have to know. Right, right. And I'm like, no, you actually don't though because it's all made up anyway. I mean, you you take the Arthur C. Clarke Well, it does because we're talking about a ship traveling at relativistic speeds and with 120 years so of, of time. So that mm. means that there's a certain distance they travel. <laughs> right, but we're also talking about cryosleep, which doesn't exist and an engine which might not exist. So we don't actually know the speed at which they are traveling. You know, like that we, we do have... because there's physics. That's the reason why. <laughs> You and your fucking physics, Daniel. Can you talk about uh, light speed travel again, Daniel? Yeah, yeah. Let's break I down. Have to, I have to, I'm looking at the figures here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, take out take out your fucking Excel spreadsheet. Put in the numbers. Yeah. Map it out. Where are we, Daniel? And which and which system are we that we've traveled 120? I mean, years? all I'm trying to figure out right now is um, because some people are asleep and some people aren't, and mm -hmm. there's 120 years that passed. Like, if it's traveling almost light speed obviously it's not traveling at it then like how much time overall has passed and then if people mm. are some people asleep how many years have they missed and is it substantial because that could affect the narrative ultimately mm. uh, i see I but see sorry i won't i'm not <laughs> going to say any of that until i find out the number <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. i see i see uh i mean i imagine that like realistically though right with our current technology if we only had 120 years would we still be within the Milky Way? I feel like we'd still be within our solar system. Am I wrong about that, Daniel? You I mean, know. we wouldn't get anywhere if we're using current technology. Like, right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We probably wouldn't. I mean, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, I'm assuming the ship can travel at least almost the speed of light, like 99% of it, yeah. because otherwise we can't get even to a close star easily, you know? <laughs> right. But I can find, I'll figure that out. And once I know, maybe um, it can be an addendum. No, I, I just, I want to point it out, like, how much I appreciate our differences when it comes to world building and storytelling, because to me, I truly don't care. And I'm so glad that you actually do because I, I and I feel like this is why we work so well together because mm -hmm. it's like, we're thinking about the same thing from opposite ends of the spectrum in many cases. And I just want yeah. to toss that out there and share my love for you with the world on the podcast. I just want Aww. to say how much I appreciate it. That's all I'm saying. Let's see. I'll have a number. Just give me a minute. <laughs> he didn't hear a fucking word. He didn't hear a word of what I just said. No, I heard no, not a word. I hope that when you listen back to this episode, you hear. I we're leaving. All I that know. In. I, I would say it. The same is true in reverse, especially when it comes to history. Like otherwise, I'd be lost with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And this is, you're yes. like, I don't. I don't care about history. I'm like, no, Daniel. Right. We have to understand why Carthage did what it did. I mean, that's why that episode was a great example because it's like it shows how to operate like in the um, constraints of the genre, right? Of the historical yeah. genre, and so that's mm -hmm. why like it changed the decisions we made, which I thought was. Cool. I can't believe we flipped so hard so fast. Like, <laughs> not in my wildest dreams did I imagine that we'd be flipping this hard so fast. But yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, Courtney, get us out of this hellscape and move us on to another concept, please. For the love of God, let's let's think about this. Um, have you done your second tenant, Rob? I'm not going to, uh, because it directly clashes with oh. some of the established stuff that we've had, and um, I need to figure out a way that I can get a second tenant in there. I mean, we could we could brainstorm if you tell us what it is. We could nudge it in a certain direction. See, that's that's the problem. <laughs> Have y'all seen Man in the High Castle? 
No. I haven't seen the show, no. um, but I'm familiar with P.E. Katie's. Okay. You're familiar with the concept, right? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So the concept, for those of you who don't know, is what if the Nazis won World War II and now the entire United States of America is essentially under Nazi control, right? It's a chilling, dystopic view into what future fascism might look like. And I wanted to, I actually wanted to establish like the main arc as kind of like a, or at least a large sub faction as purely fascistic in this, in this setting. Right. Because if we're not doing corporate dystopia, if we're not doing cyberpunk, like what else can we do? And to me, for once, I'm the one going incredibly bleak and dark with it instead of Courtney. <laughs> mm-hmm. But but here's the thing. I don't want to completely fight Daniel on that. And I'm willing to see that tenet because I think what we've got here is interesting enough where I can kind of lay off on that for now. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it could still work if we if we take it as like something that develops over time once they're on the planet, maybe. Maybe it's even something where like somebody discovers what actually happened mm-hmm. um, with the the sort of neural assassination on the ship, and that that causes them to lose trust in their leaders and and kind of start their own movement or attempt to start their own movement. They could be the enemy faction that develops yeah. on the planet, right? See, I suppose what what we're also kind of uh, what's not clear at this moment is where we are in regards to the timeline, right? Like. Where are we in this setting? We've established the history. And then, like I said before, in my mind, maybe we're like 20 years after we land or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like that to me sounds about where we are in terms of like, but, but again, I, I could be wrong. We could be like far further into the future than that. What do you think is the most interesting? I like the idea of 20 years ish, just so that we still have the people who are originally on the ship and yeah. like a new generation is starting to, mm-hmm. starting to come of age a bit. Because mm-hmm. that could follow the kids potentially, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. How how about this? Why don't we take the concept of that and have it be kind of like a rising fascistic power that's that's ju- it's not there yet, but it's mm-hmm. rising, and and people are starting to become concerned about it. Mm-hmm. That way, we can still have Daniel's beneficent billionaires, and we can also have a fascistic power that is also attractive to certain subsections of the people who are on the colony Mm -hmm. could even be like the child of one of the the billionaires who was killed on the ship like maybe the child was like an infant or a toddler young teen whatever at the time and as they've grown they've looked more into what happened Mm -hmm. so you wanted to make a little hitler basically baby hitler yeah okay (laughs) that's that's where we're going here's the issue that i might take with that is this idea that like this kid is evil because his father was, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, that's not something that I'm really interested in telling. I like this idea that maybe he's fed all of these lines from someone who survived. And like, your father was a great man. Maybe, maybe there's a loyalist who survived and he's hyping this kid up Mm -hmm. and he's the one who's taking care of him and stuff like that. Yeah. I didn't even really intend for the kid to be like blatantly overtly evil from the get go. It's more like, as he found out what happened and from his point of view, like his father was just murdered in cold blood. Mm. It's been zero days since we said, from my perspective, the Jedi are evil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I like that. I like that mm. idea where maybe you start out as this kid. And uh, again, I'm thinking it's like 20 years after the fact, this is probably like a teenager or a young adult and then starts to, first of all, meets the loyalist and then starts to uncover the quote unquote truth about what happened and starts to feel like he is owed something and starts Mm -hmm. to rise in power because he's like, look, I've been like, I've had this power in my right of rule taken from me by Mm -hmm. these people. And then you start to have that kind of creeping evil. And that's, I think that's something that I'm interested in talking about. Daniel, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think um, if ideology obviously is what governed it, you know, and that he kind of mm. changed his mind growing up based on what he was taught, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, again, I do want to stress the idea that it's something that's learned rather than something that's just, you know, oh, yeah. inherited. Yeah, I don't yeah. think anyone no, would totally. suggest that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Right, right. Like, that's why I'm vehemently opposed to baby Hitler. 
you know, like just growing up and he's got a little mustache. Oh, no, I, I was obviously I mean? kidding yeah. with, with that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense to like that you would have someone who learns this and then creates kind of a faction around it and wants it to break down their mythology because mm -hmm. it's a lie. Um, even yep. if it was well-intentioned of a lie. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that, that speaks to the roots of fascism as well as like, there's no nationalism anymore. So what do they cling to is like this concept of identity. And maybe it's mm -hmm. like this kind of corporate fascism that arises where it's like they have a loyalty to the brand and they have a loyalty to the man. And that in and of itself kind of like binds this group together through mm -hmm. violence. You know, mm -hmm. that might be an interesting concept to kind of. Explore. Well, I mean, think to um, like if the ship's journey was like a accelerated microcosm of history, right? We have people now, quote unquote, control the means of production on this planet. And there's not really like a wealthy class anymore because that's all kind of dissolved. There's still the leaders who originated from that. So now, in a sense, you're moving towards this collectivist society on the planet, right? So mm -hmm. you're past capitalism. It hasn't really happened anymore. Um, we've already gone through the bloody revolution to achieve this. But there's still elements of the ideology left, right? right. And so maybe they're saying to themselves, like, oh, you know, we don't want to live this collectivist existence. We want right. to strike our own path and create the conditions that the brand had in the past, you know, that were that right. the mythological past. And that's what mm -hmm. this kid is reaching for. Exactly. And therein lies the conflict because this, this colony is bound to have failures and bound to have struggles. And this person can look to the current failures and say, weren't things way more convenient back when my father was around, when my father was the one who had this vision. Right. You know, like, and that's something that like you can look mm -hmm. to and be like, oh yeah, that's an appeal to tradition that is mm -hmm. resonant and strong. I would say it's probably stronger among the people who like have memory of that kind of time, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm down. I'm down. I'm, I'm in with the <laughs> setting. We're like 20 years into the future. Shit's hard, but we're working towards like a collective good, but we've got this, you know, like this rising power that's evil, but for the most part, we're pretty chill, you know, like mm -hmm. we're pretty cool over here. We've got Daniel's beneficent billionaire. Um, you know what? We're going to call him Hammond. That's, that's his <laughs> canonical name. Now. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, we've got, we've got Hammond over here who maybe he was like in his forties or fifties. So he's older now, but he's still like kind of the primary billionaire whose vision is the one who really saved everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he could be like the the equivalent of the the contact billionaire that I like. Sure. Yeah. Wait, wasn't that Billy Bob Thornton in that movie? Um, I don't think he's in that movie. It's uh, what's his name? Um, he's this really weird old man. He's okay. like basically someone who's dying, and he wanted to um, he finances a second version of the project the government was building after these um religious terrorists destroy it. So he's gotcha. like the backup of it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um. Oh, I remember this now. I remember this being like a, a joke that someone made where it was like contact where they destroy the one rocket just to have a second rocket right over there off screen the entire time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the government built one and he has built one mm. secretly. Yeah, I, yeah. I just think like from a plot mm -hmm. convenience point, it is it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. It's a funny joke. That's all. I'm not here to critique contact, Daniel. I know it's your I will fight you all the time. I know. End of the days I know. <laughs> on that movie. <laughs> not only does it have Jodie Foster, who I know you yes. love. But it's also about space travel and dear God, mm -hmm. I'm not going to fight you. It's not, I, I don't have <laughs> enough time to think about contact that much. <laughs> okay. We have a conflict. We have a settlement. We have some other cool stuff that's going on here. I feel like we're missing something. I feel like there's something going on. And I think that's the planet itself mm -hmm. is lifeless to me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really feel like it's a world besides Daniel's weird, like crystalline, like objects, the BDOs in his world. Mm -hmm. What can we do to kind of flesh out this planet a little bit more? Do we, do we want to make the world building anchor about the planet in some way? Yeah, that would make sense to me. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So we're going to create our world building anchor. The planet is going to be specifically tied to this anchor itself. And the first thing we've got to figure out is the theme. So the theme surrounding this world building anchor is secrets. Okay. Appropriate considering mm -hmm. that Daniel has the geometric objects for sure. 
And the thing that is the anchor itself that's on the planet, that's it has nothing to do with the humans. That's something I'm going to toss out right now mm -hmm. is that whatever we're talking about here, this anchor is hugely important, but also has nothing to do with the human. So the thing that it is, is going to be a villain. So we've got a villain whose theme is secrets and they are directly tied to the planet. Does this mean that we have an external threat besides the internal one that we've kind of got, the conflict that we have got growing among the colony? How do we want to approach this? And it sounds like this villain is internal. It sounds like it's the baby Hitler that Courtney created. Well, no, I, I said that whatever we're talking about here has no relation to the humans. Mm -hmm. It is directly related to the planet itself. Can it be baby Hitler opening one of these <laughs> uh, geometric objects? Ooh. Okay. Unleashing something on the world. I like the idea of like maybe unleashing something that might be kind of interesting because here's the thing, right? If we attribute it to the humans, like the theme is secrets and the person is the villain. We've literally already made that happen. Mm -hmm. You're you're absolutely right, Daniel. That is baby Hitler. Like him uncovering the secrets of his family and, and his father. Like, yeah, no, that perfectly is in line with what we're talking about here. But I wanted to have it be about the planet itself to give the planet a little bit more personality besides like Eden 2 or Earth 2, you know? What if the the huge geometric objects are ancient prisons of some sort mm -hmm. of some sort of alien race that either was here originally or they they shot these things onto the planet from elsewhere and whatever is inside is just horrific and and terrible hmm. i'm getting a kind of uh raised by wolves vibes like because that that show the planet speaks to them in some weird way mm -hmm. as far as we know so far mm -hmm. not yet anyway right yeah mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got prison secrets, though. It would be nice if these objects, if they're in some way entrapping something, right? Some alien thing. Right. Um, if they're not physically there, like in a fleshy sense. Like if it's like a psychic remnant yeah. of them? Can we, can we have it so it's not like they're not physical entities, but maybe these are just like a planet where this alien species like absorbs all of its hatred or something like that? Where it's like all of the negative emotions get coalesced into these crystalline objects. And like all of the rest of the universe knows not to touch this planet because, yo, that's where that evil, like festering egg of dark emotions live. But humans don't know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would like it to maybe retain some of the mystery and that perhaps that's how it's interpreted because it's like negative mm -hmm. feeling or whatever. But I, I mean, I, I almost want to shy away from the reason why they're there. Like, um, mm. because we don't have any other aliens in the setting mm. or even the knowledge that there are aliens beyond this planet. So maybe like it is psychical. It is some kind of negative force like that. Mm -hmm. And that could empower the villain. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, that's actually exactly what I was thinking is like, maybe it's maybe that's my head cannon for it. But maybe yeah. what these things do is that when you touch them, you're infused with some kind of immense negative energy. Or, mm -hmm. And I mean that like in a psychic level. So it's like mm -hmm. it enhances whatever kind of sadistic, evil types of emotions you might have. Or a primitive sort of fear. Like, mm -hmm. because Ooh. the hatred is driven by that ultimately, like, yeah. presumably. Right? So maybe mm -hmm. it like really heightens this primal fear of survival. And that's what drives them to become fanatical. Mm -hmm. I could even see this thing being like, they're trying to use these pieces as like jewelry and they don't understand what they're doing by being in contact with these things for as long as they are. You know, like I could see that being a plot twist where it's like, oh shit, you've been wearing this piece of floating like geometric thing as a necklace and it's been slowly corrupting you or something like that, you know? Could also be something where they they went out to kind of search for resources and found these enormous things that basically seem like they're made of like rare earth minerals. Mm. Um, and maybe something with that psychic energy that they have almost attracts people who are particularly um, fearful or angry, mm. which would certainly be this this person that we've created. Yeah. And so he, he or she is like very drawn to them. And the more time that they spend out there, the more time the psychic whatever energy has to like infiltrate this person's mind. I like that. I like mm -hmm. that. Uh, visual concept. 
So Daniel, are you like married to the idea that these things are crystalline or no? Um, I don't think I ever said they're crystalline. I just mean they're geometrically okay. Yeah, shaped. geometric. Okay, can we have them be uh, made out of that stuff that's like uh, ferrous metal or whatever? Yeah. Where sure. it like mm-hmm. looks spiky and like changes shapes and stuff like that, depending cool. on. Yeah. But like we can still have them be like giant floating geometric shapes. I'm cool with that. Yeah, just as long as they're big and scary. That's all I Yeah. <laughs> I, I also like the idea that when like people get close to it, it like it stops looking so smooth and becomes like oh. a little bit spikier edged or something mm. like that. So it's like that's still yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm cool with this now. I'm down with this yeah. concept. I can so so see the scene you guys are painting of like maybe this kid is like 17, 18. He's just been such an influential force among his faction, mm-hmm. approaching one of these giant things and it's changing its form as he approaches, which is pretty fucked up. Yeah. I even have this concept that he's taking his followers out to this thing. Yeah. And like, there's a big bonfire and he's mm-hmm. standing on like a, a thing above it and behind him looms this massive geometric object that's made out of like ferrous metal and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like changing shape. It's undulating like as he's continuing to give this like speech and stuff like that mm-hmm. question mm-hmm. we have been assuming baby hitler is male because hitler yes <laughs> what if we made baby hitler female i'm cool with sure. that too that works. yeah i i have no no That'd interest in, yeah be, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm cool with that yeah i can't think like, i haven't seen many like fascist hitler character types written by a female character that no, can that's think true of, mm-hmm. which would be neat I'm, I'm also trying to think about that it's like yeah maybe i'm wrong i can't think of one <laughs> I can't either. So I think that's a good indication that we should do that. I think that's yeah. a very yeah. good idea. Yeah. And right away, then I'm thinking like, maybe this person becomes pregnant at some point and oh. something happens to the fetus because of how heavily she's been interacting with with these objects. Yeah. And like, maybe that's the like ultimate infiltration is whatever she gives birth to. I'm a little concerned about that because I'm thinking of like, we've already said baby Hitler <laughs> and I feel like we're just creating a mega Hitler by we doing get it. a literal baby Hitler. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I like where that's going because it's like, okay, is the child potentially carrying the influence of the alien? Mm-hmm. Um, but are you suggesting, Courtney, that the baby dies? I'm not totally sure. Just like something happens because she would have like this kind of additional life force within her that this thing can Uh feed off of and something could happen with that because i can see it being a catalyst if the baby dies i can see it Mm -hmm. being a huge catalyst for her to take action yeah that's true that's true we want to be careful not to fridge someone though like giving someone like a a motivation simply because they die or something like that that to me often comes off as like little cliche so Mm -hmm. like i'd like to oh i I mean like it could be i mean if if she's kind of um, off her rocker a little bit as a result of the interactions. What I mean is like it's a mm-hmm. catalyst, like it's a last straw and blaming or scapegoating her enemies, um, depending mm-hmm. on if we do that. I I am initially hesitant towards that concept in general. Mm-hmm. Like, why can't we just have a woman who's a fascist who's really into the idea of ruling? Mm-hmm. You know, like, why not just keep that concept? In? I think that concept is solid and strong enough like that we can build upon that if we need to, but I think that that's where we want to start. You know? Split the difference. So with Courtney, what if it's not her, but one of her followers who has the child? Mm-hmm. I'm fine with that. Yeah. That mm-hmm. uh, That's totally working for me. That way we don't have to like blur the lines of like, uh, you know, treading on the woman's womanness in order to <laughs> execute part of her character. But mm-hmm. we right, still keep right. the baby concept because that is weird and interesting. Yeah. Like it's a separate character. Yes. Completely agree. Yeah. And it, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be like the baby dies or she miscarries or whatever. Yeah. It could be like, because of the the way that life is growing maybe the the alien whatever can like mm-hmm. latch onto it in a way and like change yeah we've got a damien from the omen situation. yeah like change its <laughs> yeah, growth gotcha. or even like use that to change the person who's carrying the fetus like mm-hmm. some sort of weird fucked up way it's like like a superhuman yeah. we've got the x-men now <laughs> the genre changes to superheroes <laughs> honestly I'm I'm happy with that. I'm I'm totally fine with making like a mutant race of people on this fucking. Imagine planet. if like that's the twist we get is like it's superheroes. Oh god. Oh my god. Forgot yeah. About okay, that. Courtney, that is probably one of the best segues I have heard from anyone in a lot Thanks. since since Chris. I'll put it that way. Since Chris. All right. Okay. We're gonna toss this out. We're gonna see what we roll on the twist list. 
and we're gonna see how it is. Let me get the dice again. Hold mm. on. Na, 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 na. I can't na, wait to watch the '97 na, na, na. reboot of this. The '97 reboot. What do you mean? Disney is continuing the old cartoon, apparently. Um, and in, in X Men '97. That doesn't make any sense. What yeah. do you mean? They're literally picking up from how it ends. Okay, whatever. <laughs> okay. So the twist is, oh, oh boy. Mm. Um, each person slash character can only feel one emotion. Okay. That's a weird one. <laughs> yeah, some of our twist lists are weird. Mm. Like that's part of the fun. That's going to be a weird yeah, one. Yeah, I have a, a fun fact from my preliminary research. My calculator says God damn that- <laughs> We would be something like maybe eight light years away if we're traveling for 120 years in the ship. And that's assuming accelerating to some percentage of the speed of light Mm -hmm. um, over 60 years and then decelerating over the other 60. So how how far does that get us exactly? Uh, Eight light years. So mm, the range of the closest stars to us. Not very far. So it's literally the next system over, basically. More or less, like a couple systems, I'd say, yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. So our twist, this is an interesting twist. Uh, and I'm really curious as to how we're going to figure it out on the next episode. This changes a lot of what, and, and how I've kind of considered the world as is. So I'm really interested to see what we do with it next time. But before we get out of here, remember that if you want us to build your world, you can always go to our website, worldbuildwithus.com. And we will build your world within a reasonable amount of time, as long as it's not creepy or weird. Uh, Bad weird, by the way. Weird is, like, this is weird. The stuff that we do, pretty weird. Not not the good weird. Anyway, if you want to follow us on social media, we're over at Let's World Build on Twitter. If you want to come join our Discord, you can do so by following the link for that in the description of this very episode. And if you're feeling particularly generous, or you just want those sweet, sweet patron-only episodes... You can go to our Patreon with the link for that in the description and give us money. That will do it for this episode of World Build With Us. Remember that we love you very much, and we're going to get through this together until next week. Bye.